So I'm interested in understanding how the establishment of brain architecture contributes to function and uh, behavior. And I'm really excited to share with you today some of the work I did during my postdoc showing that the selective communication between matched neuronal and microglia types contributes to those uh, processes. Now, imagine you ask these two people to learn a new language who would learn it faster and uh, better, likely the kid. And the reason is that her brain is at this stage here when neurons are forming a lot of synapses. Uh, uh, and this is followed by a period of synapse pruning where the brain gets rid of all the connections that it's not using. And as a result of that, the remaining wiring is more refined and more um, efficient. That is why when a connection is used repeatedly during development and becomes permanent or uh, almost permanent. Um, and another reason why we care about this is because defects in synapse pruning have been associated with a number of neurodevelopmental neuropsychiatric disorders like autism or uh, schizophrenia. So synapse pruning is needed for normal, precise brain wiring. How is it uh, regulated? Um, well, in addition to several neuronal intrinsic mechanisms work from many labs over the last years have shown that glial cells uh, also contribute to this process, both astrocytes and uh, microglia. So microglia are the brain immune cells. They have this really ramified morphology. They continuously survey their environment. Uh, uh, they're very dynamic. They're moving like this right now in your head. And until relatively recently, it was thought that microglia will just be there, become activated in response to tissue damage, infection, and essentially clean up toxins and uh, dead neurons. And that's, of course, still true. But now we know that microglia also play a number of non-inflammatory functions during normal brain development, including the regulation of synapse pruning. So just to give you an overview of how this works, that will be important for what I will show you. Um, there are two main steps. During the first step, uh, so-called FIMI signals like chemokines or ATP are released from neurons in their synapses and will bind to receptors expressed in microglia and will recruit them. And then in a second step, molecular tags known as ITME signals will be important for the recognition and engulfment of less active synapses by uh, microglia. But synapses are not really like this. At the very least, they are like this. They are heterogeneous. Uh, and they're heterogeneous at both the molecular level, they express different cohorts of synaptic components, uh, and at the functional uh, level. And the best example is this dichotomy between excitatory and uh, inhibitory synapses. So when we think about the role of microglia, we really don't know if they're generic effectors uh, uh, of synapse pruning, or if they can discriminate between distinct types of um, synapses. And so in this work, we explore the hypothesis that functional microglia diversity has evolved to ensure pruning of inhibitory versus excitatory synapses. And we can really break this down in three specific questions. First, do microglia regulate the development of the inhibitory circuits? And if that's the case, then what are the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms? Is there any specificity? And third, what happens then at the behavioral level if we disrupt uh, the interactions? So, so starting with the first question, we didn't even know whether microglia would regulate the development of the inhibitory circuits, because what I mentioned about the role of microglia in pruning has been shown for um, excitatory synapses. So we started using a relatively blunt uh, tool. We depleted microglia for the first two postnatal weeks in mice using a pharmacological strategy. And you can see here that this strategy is very efficient. There's virtually no microglia left in the cortex. And that's true from four postnatal day four throughout development until P15 when we stop our depletion protocol and look at what happened to the cortical circuits. And today I'm going to focus on parvalbumin synapses for the inhibitory circuits and thalamic inputs as a comparison for the excitatory ones. So we deplete microglia. We looked at the different synapses, starting with excitatory synapses. And consistent with previous work, we found that they were increased in uh, microglia depleted mice, both structure when we can label presynaptically and postsynaptically these inputs, but also uh, functionally using uh, physiology. But we also found a similar increase in PV inhibitory synapses. And again, that was through both structurally, where we labeled the PV terminals, their postsynaptic site, uh, but also 
function. And this is uh, with uh, general law of physiology. So all inhibitory synapses with the frequency of the miniature inhibitory postsynaptic currents. And we wanted to make sure that this um, structural increase in PV synapses specifically was paralleled by a fu functional increase in PV inhibition. So we used optogenetics, we expressed channel rhodopsin in PV cells, stimulated them, recorded from excited neurons, and we found that higher response in uh, microglia depleted mice. And I wanted to highlight that this increase could only be observed after the initial assembly of PV synapses. So after uh, P2L, suggesting a role for microglia in the maturation or refinement of these inhibitory synapses rather than their um, formation. Right, so then the second question was, is this due to a direct interaction of microglia with uh, inhibitory synapses. And so to answer this question, we labeled PV terminals using adeno-associated viruses that express an aptophysin to be tomato under the control of a PV-specific enhancer. And we injected these viruses in mice with genetically labeled uh, microglia. And we found that the processes of microglia that you can see here in green were wrapped around these uh, synapses, like in these examples, and a subset of those was completely encapsulated within microglia and localized with uh, microglial lysosomes, as I using super-resolution microscopy. And here, actually, we're using a pH-resistant version of the fluorescent protein, so that we can see it inside the, uh, the lysosomes. But perhaps even more interestingly, these contacts were uh, developmentally regulated. There was an increase between P12 and P15, then the highest number at P15, P17, and then they decreased again at P30. But this was just a snapshot, uh, right? So we wanted to look at the dynamics of these interactions. And for that, we used exactly the same labeling tools that I just described and did in vivo to photo imaging of microglia, PV synapse interactions in layer four of the somatosensory cortex, and we did that at the peak contact period, P15, P17. And what you will see here is a microglia that over a period of 30 minutes really contacts the majority of the PV synapses that are around. So it was contacting the ones on the left, then moved to the bottom, now it's interacting with the ones on the right, one, two, three synapses, and then it will interact more with the ones at the top, and that extends the process and goes back to the um, bottom region. So when we do this for several cells and several animals, we can really get an idea of uh, what happens on average. And the first thing that we noticed was a bimodal behavior of microglia. There was a first group of cells that almost avoided or contacted very few PV synapses. And the second group of cells that contacted the majority of PV synapses around up to 60, 70% of them, pretty much like the, the cell I showed here. And we also found that within this population that interacted less with PV synapses, the interactions that did occur had a shorter duration as compared to the interaction within this population that was more actively engaged with uh, PV synapses. So that was intriguing. We thought, oh, there's different behaviors. How, is there a signaling that could mediate these different uh, interactions? And so we mined uh, published transcriptional data to identify ligand receptor pairs that were selectively expressed in uh, inhibitory neurons, not excitatory ones, and microglia increasingly during development. And among the top candidates, there was the GABA, GABA B receptor pair. And uh, um, you know, this one we saw, this, this was interesting because it actually has a, a strong precedent in addition to its role as a neurotransmitter. GABA acts as a peregrine signal to regulate several developmental processes, progenitor proliferation, neuronal migration, synapse formation, or astrocyte activity. And most of these functions are actually mediated through GABA B receptors. On the other side, previous work in the adult has shown that a subset of microglia express GABA B receptors and that microglia can actually respond to uh, GABA, for instance, they change their uh, motility. So the first thing we did at this point was to confirm that in the somosensory cortex at P15, indeed, uh, about 20 to 25 percent of microglia express both GABA B receptor subunits, so they're GABA receptive. And then we looked at the interactions of these microglia with the different synapses. And we found that PV inhibitory synapses were preferentially contacted by these GABA receptive microglia, whereas the opposite was true for excitatory synapses. They were preferentially contacted by microglia that did not express GABA B receptors. 
So then we removed GABA B receptors specifically within microglia using two distinct um, three driver lines and looked again at the contacts. And what we found was that the, these knockout cells uh, now interact with fewer TV synapses as compared to the controls, but there was no change in the proportion of excitatory synapses contacted by the knockout microglia. So then we went back to the in vivo to photon imaging experiments. And this time we did the same thing, but in the knockout. So this is the bimodal distribution that I showed you earlier. Uh, and when we did the same experiments in the knockouts, we found that the interactions were no longer bimodal. Actually, they, they more closely resemble those that interact less uh, with uh, PV synapses. So at this point, we were like, hmm, this, it seems like these GABA receptor microglia might be dedicated to um, remodeling the inhibitory synapses. But then, if that's the case, these knockout mice should have connectivity defects that are somehow similar to what we found when we completely depleted microglia, right? Um, and what we found was uh, quite remarkable. We uh, looked again at the inhibitory synapses, this time in the knockout, and uh, uh, we found that they were increased in uh, GABA conditional knockout mice, both structurally and uh, functionally using physiology. So, what this shows is that removing GABA-B receptors from microglia phenocopies the effect on inhibitory synapses that we had seen when we had completely depleted uh, microglia. But then when we looked at the excitatory synapses, we found no um, effect in the game structure or functionally. And so what this also shows is that removing GABA-B receptors from microglia decouples the effect on inhibitory versus excitatory synapses that we had seen um, in microglia with mice. So then the next question was, what are the mechanisms downstream of GABA B receptors in uh, microglia? And so for that, we isolated microglia from the somatosensor cortex of P15 control and GABA B knockout mice and did uh, single cell RNA sequencing. And here you can see that control and knockout cells align pretty well. They segregate in eight mixed clusters, and I won't go into the details of what these clusters are, but an important message here is that removing GABA-B receptors from microglia doesn't fundamentally alter the range of microglia states that can be uh, observed in the, in the knockout. So then within each of these mixed clusters, we compared control and uh, knockout cells. And we found that the cluster where they were more different was this cluster four. Now, Cluster 4 contains microglia that express higher levels of what is known as homeostatic microglia core genes. The, the, the more mature microglia are more likely to be involved in, um, in pruning. And so we then looked at the identity of these differentially expressed genes within um, cluster 4. <clears throat> and we found that they were broadly involved in pruning. When I say broadly involved in pruning, what I mean is that they included classical uh, pruning genes, but also genes involved in uh, motility, migration, cell cell addition, or phagocytosis. So it's really not one or two genes that are changed. It's a whole uh, program uh, that is different in uh, these knockout cells. And since obviously we had single cell resolution, we noticed that um, these genes were altered only in a specific subset of microglia, around 20 and 25% of them. And actually these affected cells segregate as a transcriptionally distinct subcluster within um, cluster four. So at this point, the obvious question is, are these GABA receptive uh, microglia? And unfortunately, we couldn't answer this question using single cell RNA-seq because the expression of GABA-B receptors in uh, uh, microglia is relatively low. So we had a lot of what is known as dropout events, essentially an incomplete detection of GABA receptive microglia. And so to address this, we instead used more fish. There is a hybridization-based spatial transcriptomic uh, technique. And since it's hybridization-based, uh, it's more sensitive. And we did the same thing. We took control, knockout mice, P15. They went through the Murphy's pipeline. And when we clustered those cells, if you focus here on this cluster 4 and 4GG here, these are, again, microglia that express higher levels of homeostatic microglia core uh, genes. So they're similar to the cluster 4 microglia that I showed earlier in the um, single cell RNA-seq. But now we can see a subset that actually is 4GG that expresses GABA-B uh, receptors. And since we had spatial information, we could see that GABA receptor microglia were interspersed um, among the uh, cells that do not express GABA-B receptors, and they are uniformly 
distributed across uh, um, the different cortical uh, layers. So then we took uh, some of those genes that we had seen as downregulated uh, using the single cell RNA seq, and sure enough, they were also downregulated using more fish, but now we could see that they were selectively downregulated in this cluster 4 uh, GG, so GABA receptive microglia within cluster 4, not other cluster 4 cells, and not GABA receptive microglia within the other clusters. And so what this shows is that the transcriptional changes that we have seen in the knockout are restricted to um, GABA receptive uh, microglia. So then the last question here was, does it matter uh, what happens at the behavioral level if we disrupt uh, this interaction? And so to answer this, we used MOSIC or motion sequencing that was developed by the data lab at Harvard Medical School that allows unsupervised analysis of mouse behaviors, really based on the idea that behaviors compose a specific, specific motifs that are called um, syllables in music, like a specific type of run or a rear, and they all come together following a specific structure to produce um, continuous behavior. And so when we looked at the usage of syllables in control and GABA-B knockout mice, we found that the knockout upregulated syllables like grooming or running or jumping and downregulated um, syllables associated with uh, different types of pulsing uh, behavior. And here you have an example of a run that is upregulated in the mutants. And uh, um, here we have grooming. And obviously, we are overlaying all the different uh, animals from the different uh, recording sessions. And in general, when we looked at their locomotor activity, we actually found that the knockouts um, explore more. They have a an overall higher locomotor activity, suggesting hyperactivity. And finally, when we looked at these state maps where the nodes are the different syllables and the edges are the transitions between them, what we found was that um, these knockout mice downregulate the majority of the transitions between syllables. So essentially, they may oscillate between this repetitive running and grooming and downregulate the, the rest of the, the behaviors. And so to summarize what I show you, we have seen that during development, GABA binds to GABA-B receptors and GABA receptive microglia. It activates a synapse remodeling program, changing motility, cell cell adhesion, phagocytosis. As a result of that, these cells contact more and more inhibitory synapses during development. And that is why if you remove all microglia, like in the depletion, you'll have a change in both excitatory and um, inhibitory synapses. But if you only remove GABA-B receptors from GABA receptor microglia, you will selectively alter inhibitory but not excitatory connectivity. And we have seen that those defects will persist throughout the life of the animal and ultimately impact uh, behavior. So essentially, the, the, the main implication of this work is that it suggests that brain wiring and potentially function relies on the selective communication between matched neuronal and uh, microglia types. And with that, I wanted to thank the people who contributed to this work. Of course, Gord Fischel has been an extremely supportive uh, supervisor. A number of people in the Fischel lab also helped. I was also really lucky to mentor a number of undergraduate and graduate students. And in particular, I wanted to highlight uh, Bonnie and uh, Ajoa to very talented and dedicated undergraduate students who really helped a lot over the years. Um, I want to thank our collaborators, uh, Beth Stevens, who's been there since the beginning, feedback, advice, sharing mice. Uh, more recently, Lloyd, Karen, and Sami for the Morfish experiments, and uh, Bob Dutt and this postdoc uh, Ayman, who were great collaborators for the MOOCIC behavioral uh, experiments. Uh, and also, everyone shared mice and um, kindly reagents uh, and our funding. And thank you. I'll stop sharing.